Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy learning. We are gathered today for the session three on, on gender and sustainable development discourses as part of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy Praxis for a Peaceful and Gender Just World Order, organized, every, organized weekly every Friday of September, starting September 9th. This training course is organized by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung India Office and IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center, GISC, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. I would like to start off the program by remembering the great Madam Hansa Mehta, who was India's representative to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. While the U Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being adopted by the United Nations, she strongly opposed to the phrase, all men are born equal, and fiercely advocated for what eventually led to the adoption of Article 1 of the Declaration that all human beings are born free and equal. So now just uh, quickly, I'll give you a brief background about the program. Feminist foreign policy, which has often been relegated to the margins, is now slowly gaining a much deserved recognition as a result of the efforts of the peacekeeping, peace building and peace making by the tra uh, Transnational Feminist Solidarity Network. And a feminist foreign policy provides a powerful lens through which we can counter the violent global systems of power, especially the established systems of power, that is patriarchy, racism, cultural nas nationalism, imperialism, and materialism. And that leaves the majority of the population in perpetual status of vulnerability and despair. It further pro puts the promotion of gender equality and women's rights at the center of a nation's diplomatic agenda. And taking cue from the European Union foreign policy, a progressive foreign policy, progressive feminist foreign policy consists of three R's, which has which I would like to reiterate: rights, representation, and resources. And over a period of last two weeks, this course has been providing the participants a nuanced perspective on the challenges towards gender equality locally, nationally, regionally, and also globally. And it advocates that voices against the gender biases must be made more vocal, which would definitely aid in the steady elimination of exclusive masculine agencies over a period of time. The program themes of this uh, uh, pro monsoon school includes gender, peace and security, gender dimensions of the United Nations Security Council. These two have been covered in the last two weeks. Today, we'll be understanding gender and sustainable development discourses. And in the next and the final uh, week, it would be on gender, international relations and diplomacy. The chair of the program is Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor, IMPRI, and eminist, eminent economist and feminist scholar. We are grateful to our distinguished experts for gracing the monsoon school, Dr. Swarna Rajagopalan, Dr. Vahida Nayanar, Professor Roxana Marinescu, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Meenal Srivastav, Ambassador Anil Trigunayar, and Professor Neelima Srivastav. The conveners of this program are Ms. Jyoti Rawal from FES India, Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. Arjun Kumar from IMPRI. I welcome you all to this enlightening deliberation, and I thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts into understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in promoting gender equality and foreign policy and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course for impactful policy research and action. As always, I'd like to reiterate that the course outline and reading resources are available on the event page for your kind perusal. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Please share your questions on the Q&A box only. Please do not, do not post your questions as an anonymous attendee. Ensure that your questions are precise 
and refrain from making general comments in order to save time. Now, let me introduce to you our experts for today's session on gender and sustainable development discourses. We are privileged to have Professor Roxana Marinescu, Professor, Faculty of International Business and Economics, Department of Mo Modern Languages and Business Communication, Bucharest University of Economic Studies, Romania. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us today from Romani Romania and gracing the Monsoon School. And our second uh, distinguished expert is Professor Vibhuti Patel, Visiting Distinguished Professor at IMPRI. Now, without any further ado to the program, let us start. And it is my honor to invite Ms. Jyoti Rawal, Madam, from FES India office to start the program with her remarks, followed by Chair's remarks and lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, and I welcome you all once again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta, for this wonderful introduction of the webinar series and of the panel today. This has really set the tone for our event today, so thank you very much for that. Dear Professor Roxana Marinescu, dear Dr. Vibhuti Patel, dear Dr. Arjun Kumar, dear participants. On behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, it is my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the third session of the FES IMPRI webinar series on feminist foreign policy. A big thank you to the IMPRI team and to Dr. Vibhuti Patel that we are gathered together here in this room for this webinar series. A very special welcome goes out today to our key speaker today, Professor Roxana Marinescu. Thank you very much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and for sharing your insights uh, with us on such an important topic. We're really looking forward to learning from you. Feminist foreign policy primarily aims at promotion of values and good practices to achieve gender equality and to guarantee that all women enjoy their fundamental rights. The practice initiated in Sweden, which was also the first country way back in 2014 to have adopted a feminist foreign policy, followed by Canada, France, Luxembourg, Spain, Libya, and also Germany now. It just goes to show that there's a tremendous amount of appetite, I would say, for uh, you know keeping the discussions on on feminist foreign policy which in the most general sense adopts an approach that sees feminist rights more from the right angle of a human right approach rather than issues of a specific gender. In the fast changing realm of international relations where nation states do not have permanent alliances or partnerships, nation states certainly do have permanent interests and I would say to be in the pursuit of gender justice is a, let's say it's a pursuit that all countries, all nation states, states strive to have. And hence there is a very pertinent need to be looking at our policies, both domestic and foreign policies with a gender lens. We are aware if we talk about the Indian context that despite a constitutional mandate which provides for equality to people of all genders, patriarchal mindsets continue and it hampers the path to equality. Over the years, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, as an organization which is committed to the values of social democracy, has tried to address the issue of gender equity through our various activities. FES is one of the oldest foundations of Germany dedicated to the principles of peace, solidarity, and social justice. From our core mission of promoting social justice, we derive the light motif for promoting gender justice. We have offices in about 100 countries worldwide, and in India, we've been active since 1983. In the gender unit of our India office, we've been working on the issues of women in politics, women in work, and on the issues of gender sensitization. But today we are here to listen to Professor Marinesco, and I will request Professor Vibhuti Patel to please chair the session and take the event forward. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute. So thank you very much, Jyotiji. And I would like to greet, uh, first of all, all the participants who are here in large number and also thank IMPRI team for their hard work and putting this whole program together. Uh, let us have a recap of what all happened uh, in the first day 
uh, Dr. Swarna Rajgopal acclimatized us with the gender and the whole uh, discussion on peace and what all has been happening in after the post-war, first post-second world war period in terms of peace initiatives uh, and the role of the women's organizations and the human rights organizations. In the second day on 16th of uh, September, uh, Vaida Naina, Dr. Vaida Naina, she spoke on the gender dimensions of UN Security Council and the recognition of women's central role as an active agent in contributing to international peace and security by the United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 and uh, other 11 resolutions that were passed from uh, to, through the year 2000 to 2020. And uh, women, peace and security perspective, how it is gaining, uh, in, increasingly gaining ground and how 30 to 35 feminists, uh, they played pivotal role in engendering uh, UN Security Council discourses and making them sensitive to the women's specific uh, requirements uh, in the peace negotiations. And today we are going to discuss uh, uh, sustainable development uh, issues. An overarching concern of the feminist foreign policy is a human development with gender equality, responsiveness towards intersectional vulnerabilities based on caste, class, race, ethnicity, religion, ableism, geographical location, and gender. Hence, the feminist foreign policy stresses that macroeconomy must include marginalized and underrepresented persons in the value human development investment okay. in undeserved communities in terms of subsidized education, public health, safe environment, gainful employment, and skill building, ensuring absence of slavery in supply chain and, and trafficking of women and children, paying fair prices to suppliers, farmers, self-employed women, practicing gender inclusive policies through gender responsive legislations, humanize the labor relations. They must become the top priority of the global leaders to fulfill these promises of sustainable development goals, which are 17 in number. Each nation state should disclose greenhouse gas emission and also climate risk exposure due to business activities and provide clean fuel to the household and improve processes to reduce Use waste, including packaging and uh, distribution, and social security for recycling workers, improving methods of production, replace hazardous and drudgery prone labor processes. So, feminist demand from the governments that they create ecosystem for educating and encouraging uh, suppliers and the citizens to adhere to the strict standards, build domestic and global partnership in healthcare, education program, training on non-exploitative basis, which, which is a need of an hour, and assessing and correcting gaps in resources use and waste procedure, procedures in is an important area for social audit. So for revising internal policies to eliminate unintended gender biases and discrimination, proactive efforts uh, to promote gender equal practices uh, is very, very important and public education is very important. And as Jyoti Ji said that all nation states, they have a permanent interest in the uh, for, for, for their domestic as well as foreign policies. So uh, consensus around sustainable development goals of 189 countries uh, is with this uh, spirit that we have a common goal uh, to achieve. And uh, with this, uh, I think, introduction, I think we will begin the technical session. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for uh, this uh, brilliant introduction to what is going to uh, come up next uh, in uh, in your uh, presentation and also Professor Marinescu's uh, presentation. So uh, brilliantly, you have highlighted uh, the, the various dimensions, the social, economic, and also environmental dimensions, uh, the cross-cutting themes as, uh, as it applies to uh, the feminist uh, scholarly uh, uh, network and also from the feminist lens. So uh, that really provides a very good uh, background at, and it sets the tone to uh, our session three on gender and sustainable development discourses. Now, uh, after your remarks, I would like to invite you to make your presentation um, on, the, on the theme. So yeah. thank you very much, uh, Dara Kusumi Mehta. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Where is my one minute? I have to. Yeah. 
so friends my today the highlight of my discourse is around gender equality for sustainable tomorrow and we have to begin now there is no time left for us and there are can so many put it on full screen it is uh, it, i can make it on full screen yeah so as you know that uh, during last two years the major access may, around which the feminist discourses have taken place is that break the bias that we have seen that how the gender biases are creating a lot, so many impediments in achieving gender equality and be, because of the, the pandemic in, uh, triggered calum uh, human miseries has affected women the most. So diversity, equality and inclusion, they are the main mottos of the sustainable development goals. UN Women announced the theme of inter on, uh, on International Women's Day in March 2021, that women in leadership, so I think women's role in the leadership uh, is extremely important. That is also the uh, more, uh, concern of the feminist foreign policy and uh, addressing intersectionality, including all gender identities is very important. We have to go beyond gender binary and confronting the underlying patriarchy of our world while choosing the, the kind of uh, issues that we are going to fight and the battles that we have to fight. Uh, so we all, let us remember our four mothers who paved the way for women's progress and women's development and gender equality. It was in 1911 that women were marching in the streets of several nation states uh, asking for bread and roses. They were fighting against war. They were demanding peace. And many of you must have uh, heard this song as we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day. Uh, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand mills of gray are touched with all radiance that a sudden sun discloses for the people here are singing bread and roses, bread and roses. I strongly request you to listen to this song. It is sung by several renowned singers uh, in their own version. Now coming to the sustainable development goals, as you know that there are 17 goals and the approach towards these goals is that you have a dedicated goal gender, gen, of gender equality, which is goal number five. But in all of the 17 goals also, we need to do gender mainstreaming. So when you are addressing poverty, you have to be uh, considerate that we, as women are at the bottom of the poverty pyramid, we have to make concerted effort that they are included in all the anti-poverty program. Same with hunger good health or quality education, clean water and sanitation, renewable energy, good jobs uh, uh, and innovation and infrastructure, reduce uh, re all the measures of addressing reduction of inequality. They should also be sensitive to gen they should be gender responsive and gender sensitive, how to make our city sustainable. So it is not only the smart city, but they have to be safe city. They should be gender friendly city, responsible consumption, uh, fight against the consumerist culture. And uh, we have to leave, uh, lead a sustainable life so that we leave some uh, all the resources, natural resources, and the resources on this planet Earth for the future generation. When it comes to climate action, also it is very important that women are uh, uh, that gender issues are taken into consideration, and the resilience which the communities have shown should be acknowledged. Life below water, life on land, peace and justice issues, about which I think previous two uh, sessions by Dr. Swarna and Dr. Uh, Vaida also discussed in great length. And we also need partnerships for the goals because all of us have a permanent interest, all the nation states. So the UN Women has declared that gender equality is a right. Fulfilling this right is the best chance we have in meeting some of the most pressing challenges of our time, from economic crisis to lack of health to climate change to violence against women and escalating conflicts which we all are witnessing uh, uh, on this planet uh, and currently some of the most uh, devastating experiences that we have had uh, with the wars, uh, war culture and the Ukrainian war. Uh, women are not only more affected by these problems, but also possess ideas and leadership to solve them. And that was so many innumerable examples were given in the previous two sessions. The, the gender discrimination is still holding too many women back and holds our work uh, world also back too. Uh, 
So 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 goals adopted by the world leaders in 2050 embody a roadmap for progress that is sustainable and leaves the, the, the motto is leave no one behind. So achieving gender equality and women empowerment is integral to each of the 17 goals, as I said earlier. So when it comes to goal number one, where we talks about the poverty, we need to realize that there are women are at the bottom of poverty pyramid, pandemic triggered loss of livelihoods and uh, loss of loved ones uh, uh, that, that uh, they need extra handholding and they also need affirmative action by the nation states. Women headed household, that means households managed by widows, separated, deserted and women facing permanent migra migration of male members. They also are poorest of the poor and COVID, now we have a new terminology called COVID widows and COVID orphans, their needs are to be taken care of in the anti-poverty pro anti -poverty programs. And over 100 million women and girls, they, are, they need to be lifted out of poverty. Uh, that means they are below poverty line and they have to be lifted through affirmative action. When it comes to the second goal, which talks about the uh, equal uh, equity uh, in the systemic differences that we are finding in terms of opportunity and access to social resources. I think there also gen uh, it is very important to uh, goal number two also talks about the improved food security and nutrition. So in all the programs addressing hunger, and we know that after the pandemic, uh, massive hunger uh, in Africa, Latin America, and uh, Asian countries have been found, including in India. The global hunger report is out and it is giving of extremely devastating information that women are and women are more likely to be affected by malnutrition. And I think the uh, Oxfam report released this week only also has corroborated this uh, fact. And that's why what we need in this thing for a targeted intervention, we also need gender desegregated data that when it comes to hunger and malnutrition, what is the percentage of population which is uh, facing acute malnutrition, which are the ones who are moderate malnutrition and where what kind of intervention strategies we need to have. And it comes to goal number three, which talks about the focus on women's reproductive health issues. So women's reproductive health issue generally gets relegated in the background. We saw even during the pandemic, so maternity wards were converted into COVID ward. And so many women had to deliver babies on the road and there were there were no non-availability of menstrual pads and women were facing there were no contraceptives available so many unsafe abortions took place so it is very important when we talk about health for all then we need to think uh, we need to be conscious about neonatal and infant mortality adolescent health health needs of transgender persons mental health issues and also state-sponsored insurance schemes and doctors because currently there is a privatization of insurance and that creates so that, that leaves so many people in the poverty groups. They are left. They, they are left out of healthcare facilities. Gender gap in vaccination. In fact, gender back gap between the nations in Africa. Hardly two percent of the population were could avail uh, vaccination because vaccination program was under the private sector, and there was a commercialization of vaccination. Financing for gender equality. Uh, for uh, in in women and health that is very important so starting from the individual women's pro individuals problem to interpersonal interaction that in the household how the resources are allocated the community uh, how does it respond to the health needs of people in the environment of stigma if you have a covid you get stigmatized if you have a hiv aids you get stigmatized and the culture tradition discrimination they also need to be kept into consideration when it comes to goal number 4 where we talk about the lifelong learning opportunities because 21st century calls it uh, is declared as a knowledge economy and we need to continuously enhance our knowledge so need to move beyond basic literacy for women and understand the complex capabilities in learning and education including access to uh, ict and skill development uh, bridging the digital divide because it majority of women are outside the digital communities and vocational education is very important gender responsive budgeting in education and also making a special effort to inculcate interest in STEM subjects, science, technology, mathematics, and engineering, because even in the climate discourse or even in the leadership, uh, when it comes to the leadership leadership of women, then your, your proficiency in the STEM subject is extremely important in the current context. 
Uh, when we talk about the goal number five of SDG, where we are talking about includes uh, the basic uh, capacity building and uh, the, the need for inclusion of uh, th threshold capacities, that's very important. Need to understand cultural constraints and the gender norms that uh, come in the way of development of women. Confronting gender-based violence and women's participation in decision-making, it's very important. As it is shown in this uh, graph, that how the kind of hurdles that women face, and that's why they remain at the lower level while the man can climb up in the career ladder, wherever they are, whether they are doctors or engineers or uh, decision makers or politicians. Uh, when we talk about the uh, goal number six, where which which is about the wash, wash is the water, uh, sanitation and hygiene. Uh, women's access to clean water and sanitation needs gender desegregated attention. Since the girls and women bear larger burden of ensuring access to water for household, and there are several cultural and religious barriers for women to access sanitation, especially menstrual and the postpartum access. So that is very important. When it comes to country like India, caste-based access Exclusion. I think there are massive documentation done by the Dalit organizations that how most of the cases of violence against Dalit women are linked to the wash issue when they try to access clean water because most of the water resources and the sanitation resources are located in the uh, caste Hindu areas and they are deprived because they are they are they are made to stay outside the village. In goal number seven, and to ensure access, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern energy sources. We know that majority of women have a respiratory tract problem mainly because of the unclean and hazardous fuel which they are forced to use because they are, they, the clean energy is not there. So that is a top priority and, major, uh, uh, and addressing uh, the whole renewable, recyclable, and uh, safe energy resources becomes a top priority. In goal number eight, which talks about the promote sustainable, inclusive uh, uh, growth uh, uh, in the industrial sector, productive employment, and the decent work as it is suggested by the ILO decent work agenda, uh, economic productivity, supporting entrepreneurship, innovation, decrease, decreasing the environmental degradation through more sustainable production and consumption. That is a very important concern. Uh, access to remunerated employment. Uh, it's also like we have seen currently in the post-COVID era that uh, globally also 40% of women who are working in a pre-pandemic period, they are not uh, back to the workforce because of the increased care burden and also the shrinking of the economy has become slower. Uh, in India, it is even worse because we have currently official data says that it is 25% of women who are currently in the workforce. So we have millions of women with the degrees, but degrees don't translate into career. Need for a gender disaggregated data is very, very important in the world of work and address the issues like wage gap and discrimination. Women get one third in certain globally, if we see women get one third of the wages of uh, men and majority of the work which women do is in an unpaid arena. And so the whole subsistence production that they do, it is totally unpaid. And currently the demand globally, as well as in our country, in India is formalization of informal sector and registration of all workers because informal sector there is a law of jungle and none of the protective label legislations which provide social protection social security are applicable there uh, in uh, in this goal uh, number seven we, which is about the social and physical infrastructure uh, where women have a less likely to be represented in manufacturing and other industries, quality infrastructure at the regional and transborder levels, developing industrialization in poor countries and increasing access to financial services for small businesses and uh, retrofitting the industries towards cleaner technologies and processes and increasing public and private scientific research spending is very, very important. R&D budget of most of the developing countries is less than 1%. So that also creates so much of problems. There are so many hazardous uh, industries and occupational hazards are day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, tragedies that are happening in the developing world. So the second issue is that of a subsidized and safe transport. Currently, the major challenge that uh, women face is uh, how to reach from home to workplace. From Girls find it difficult if there is no safe transport to go to the school, they drop out. 
Third issue is that of a collection of gender disaggregated, uh, disaggregated data uh, on the causes and uh, effects of women's exclusion and provide solutions towards increasing women's access and opportunities in manufacturing and R&D. In goal number 10, which is about redu reduction of inequality. So this particular goal is linked with so many other goals about poverty, hunger, food security, peace, environment, and finances. So the important areas like human rights violation, access to social protection, gender, migration, we saw the tragedies uh, that we the experience during the pandemic uh, triggered lockdown. The people had to really migrate. And it's not only in India, it is in India, we have a parliamentary democracy so everything was in public and in so many countries even we have not we don't even uh, have data or we don't have those videos where the migrant people the innumerable uh, problems that they faced uh, during the lockdown uh, and also uh, need to elaborate uh, on intersectionality with race ethnicity disability aging gender and other identities and action should be taken to achieve income growth for 40 percent of the population globally which is below the um, national average of their income and empower inclusion regardless of age ethnicity religion and to eliminate discriminatory laws and policies and to improve regulation of global financial market and facilitate people's migration and mobility uh, so the, the kind of criminalization and brutalization of the migrant population that is taking taking place that needs to be addressed uh, when it comes to the question of inclusive uh, and uh, more sustainable growth, the, we need to understand how spaces are creating a safe spaces. So the, it, the spaces have, are gendered, we all know, how this affects women's ability to access, use these spaces, the so role of housing, public transport, sanitation, water supply needs to be sensitive to gender requirements and UNSDG, uh, the, uh, this goal, aims to normalize access to affordable housing, sustainable transport system, enhanced urban planning and management, and increased protection of cultural and natural heritage and municipal services shall focus on air quality, green spaces, and waste management. So I think this is the goal number 11 on sustainable cities and communities. So the focus is not on just technology. Technology can assist sustainable cities, but the main thing is the human development and human uh, security that should be the center stage. In goal number 12, which, uh, is, which is about ensure sustainable consumption and production pattern, where the question, and, and I think pandemic has taught us that why it is important to have a decentralized production, reduction in the packaging, uh, the waste and the use of plastic in the packaging or making more involved friendly and recyclable uh, 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 packaging that is important and the consumerist culture uh, that also has to be uh, addressed. So women are primary decision makers in terms of consumption in the household and need to understand women's role in ensuring sustainable production, consumption and recycling. And uh, this is a 10 year framework of programs towards more responsible consumption uh, more responsible per habits and efficient use of natural resources and less food waste, uh, food and food losses along the supply chain. The UN encourages companies to integrate sustainability into their processes and also contribute to raising public awareness for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles. In goal number 13, which is about the climate action and currently everybody, all the uh, nation states and all the subnational level discourses are also around climate change. But nobody, the, 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 we all are experiencing day in and day out the inconveniences for the middle class and upper class and then the human miseries as they are shown in this picture, which are created due to uh, sudden uh, uh, changes in the weather and the complete uh, cycle, the seasonal cycle also have been upset. Impact of gender and climate change is not adequately addressed so far, but now, the, now uh, it is very important that uh, in the 21st century it's going to be, uh, and it has been a very, very important uh, uh, issue, whether it is a deluge or tsunami or earthquake or uh, melting of glacier due to global warming. These are very important issues. Women are both the victim of 
uh, climate change, but at the same time, they have also shown resilience to, uh, to mitigate the impact of climate change. And it comes to life below ocean, uh, life below water. The ocean seas, uh, there we, we need to accept the women's role in blue economy, which is generally ignored. Uh, this goal seeks to urgently reduce water pollution, protect marine and uh, coastal ecosystem, regulate fishing and harvesting, where the big trawlers, they are doing massive damage to the environment, to the sea life, and also so many species. In fact, the currently uh, communities in Sundarban have said that there are 22 species of fish have disappeared in last 10 years uh, and fight the illegal practices in the uh, um, sea and other water bodies. And and also empower women uh, in, for, in the informal sector, especially the fisher folks who don't have any technological aid, who don't get benefit of any infrastructure from the physical infrastructure from the state. Goal number 15 is about the sustainable human development, about human uh, uh, the biodiversity and the nature-based resources. Women are adversely affected by the disaster. And I think my, so many documentations by UN, uh, uh, UN bodies have shown that what we need is a gender disaggregated data of the impact of and the consequences of this disaster, what kind of financing that we need for the empowerment of the communities which are affected. Women's connection to environment is ignored despite significant eco-feminist movements. And especially in developing countries, women in rural areas depend on non-timber forest produce for the sustenance and livelihood. Recently, I just submitted, I, I did the peer review of countries of, of forest dwellers' lives in seven Asian countries. And the kind of devastating findings that you get at a ground level show that we need a very, very uh, we need to take this issue very seriously. And a UN Global Assessment Report reveals that around 1 million animal and plant species are threatened with extin extinction and some in a very, very near future. So it is a very alarming situation. And the SDG for life on lands calls for urgent action and global cooperation to increase reforestation, minimize soil erosion, and protect species, both plant species and animal species. This includes ending poaching and trafficking and addressing illegal wild, wildlife product trade, which is a global, very, very strong mafia that controls this trade. In goal number 16, where we talk about the Women, Peace and Security Index, I need not say much. We had two full sessions on this in this, in this monsoon school. But women are often unable to access justice and law institutions on par with men. Vaida gave ample examples in her uh, talk. A uh, mere focus on homicide and trafficking narrows the range of injustice that women face routinely. Also, male bias of public services, legislatures, and law enforcement and judiciary need to be monitored to provide more inclusive spaces for women. And the UN believes that strong legislation is needed to reduce violence, exploitation of children, reduce illegal arms flow, and combat organized crime, and access to justice and, pro and protection of fundamental freedoms uh, that they, they, that shall be equal for all. No one should be excluded. Now, in this uh, goal, we are talking about the revitalization of global partnership for sustainable development, which is the very important. This is the last 17 goals where all the countries, the, the nation states who have accepted SDGs, 189 countries, the rich countries should support the poor, poor uh, developing countries. That should uh, and rich within the nation state, they should also have a responsibility uh, for social justice, gender justice, environmental justice, distributive justice and uh, also uh, the question of uh, dignity of a human person that has to be accepted. So the major goal is financing for gender equality as a separate component for development financing and global partnership, and also gender responsive budgeting, which is to raise citizens' awareness on gender impacts that budget policies have on women and men, and also to change budgets and policies to promote gender equality in the five important areas where there is a gender gap, education, health, uh, employment, uh, decision-making, and gender-based violence, uh, and to make governments accountable for gender equality through budgetary commitments. So developing countries need to support the form of financial resources, the they, they debt relief, and that is a big, that is a big demand that 
debt relief should be provided to African countries and the restructuring as well as investment in local ventures. They should also benefit from access to science and technology so that uh, so they too can experience sustainable development. So all the countries currently we see the floods in Pakistan or, or, or the in global support and solidarity to, uh, to communities in Afghanistan, which is facing hunger and malnutrition. So I think that that, that is the spirit that we have. So gender data gap, most important to bridge this gender data gap by making conscious effort to get the uh, very, very specific gender specific data so that uh, intervention can take place. Decent work and economic growth. We currently 740 million women, they are working in the informal economy. Seven in 10 workers are in essential occupations are the women. And we also know that even during the pandemic, the, the uh, Corona warriors among them, 70% of them were women as a doctors and scientists and uh, nurses and uh, sanitation workers and community-based workers. Two in three teaching professionals are women globally and all of them are in uh, informal economy. So what we need that the state and non-state actors, industry and uh, communities and the local self-government bodies, they have to come together to address this uh, sustainable development goals. Um, I have shared the readings and I'm also going to share the uh, PPT, uh, so uh, you can go through it in detail. These are some of the important references for uh, uh, further reading, where the question of public-private partnership, question of gender equality and infrastructure, glo global acceleration plan, which the 64 women leaders took initiative after the pandemic that we would, gender equality forum is created, ILO and OECD's documents are of the and the G G20 countries which have come up with the common program. Uh, UN Women has also provided this gender uh, equality perspective and the, uh, some of the database and the ground level uh, reality that we have experienced during pandemic. What are its learnings? So these are uh, and UNICEF's work on uh, gender equality strategy for children and girls especially an action coalition of global acceleration plan. Uh, that is uh, the, the second meeting which took place both in Mexico and Paris, there were meetings and the, the gender global gender gap report of the World Economic Forum. And I think by, uh, that's very important to go through. Thank you very much. So with that, let us invite Professor Roxana Marin. Now over to you. Thank you very much. Let me first uh, share my PowerPoint presentation with you. Uh, okay, let me go full screen. Um, is it visible now for you? Because yes. some, somehow I have lost uh, all of you. No, okay. You can yeah, let, me again. Uh, let me go to the full screen again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let me first um, uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this series of presentations in uh, feminist uh, foreign policy. And um, of course, uh, you know, it is uh, indeed very important and uh, very relevant to have this perspective. And um, I am extremely honored to be to be part of this uh, activity. Um, so you have listened um, so far to Professor Vibhuti Patel, and thank you very much for, for doing that, uh, to her in-depth analysis of how gender is integrated in all the 17 um, SDGs. Uh, so I'm not uh, going to go uh, through that again. We heard very clear explanations uh, on discrimination against women and girls in uh, different areas uh, with uh, the respective indicators. Uh, we have listened to uh, how the specific um, SDG uh, goal five addresses uh, gender equality and empowerment of women. Um, and um, with all the, again, all the nine targets and uh, specific in 14 specific indicators, which you now have on the screen. Um, also, um, uh, you probably know, you, uh, you understood from the presentation that um, uh, progress has been slow. And we have this report from 2022, which you probably know of, which deals with uh, all the 17 um, 
um, SDGs. And uh, here I just uh, wanted to underline the slow progress in uh, SDG 5 uh, gender equality. So I thought for my presentation, I would focus more on the European Union and uh, its policy uh, in um, uh, sustainable uh, development and how SDG 5 most particularly is applied in the European Union. Also to look a little bit at the, uh, so, uh, what they call the feminist uh, foreign policy. Um, and uh, uh, after presenting these top-down ideas about gender equality and uh, uh, gender and sustainable development discourses to also present some of the bottom-up ones, so some of the grassroots uh, sustainable discourses. Um, so regarding the European Union in 2022, this is the progress which has been made in uh, SDG 5 according to uh, our institution, which is called Eurostat, which presents statistics of the European Union. And you can see that generally uh, what they say is that uh, there has been some progress with some exceptions, which you can see on the screen, the little red arrows. Uh, but generally, um, apparently in the European Union, the si situation is uh, getting better. We also have in the European Union, the uh, European uh, uh, Institute for Gender Equality, which every other year releases um, an index score. And here you have the latest, which was uh, released in 2021, but the data is from uh, 2019 uh, after Brexit, so UK is not included. And here you can see the average index for the European Union in terms of gender equality, which is 68 out of 100. And um, here you can see uh, all the different countries in the European Union. And you can see that the highest score goes to Sweden, which is an example, I suppose, for all of us in the EU. And with the lowest scores, um, however, above uh, 50, um, of uh, most of the countries in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, countries uh, um, which were former, uh, formal, formerly uh, in the USSR sphere of influence uh, with the last uh, place, uh, Hungary, 53.4. Here on the right-hand side, you can see the, the elements which contributed to this uh, index. And again, in the EU, you can see that health is doing uh, best at 87.8, the index for health, meaning that uh, uh, generally speaking, but not entirely, uh, women uh, are treated as well as men in the health sector. And the lowest is power, especially uh, representation, and as we will see uh, in a minute. Now, regarding the European Union policy uh, policies in place addressing specifically uh, SDG 5, um, I tried to make a summary of them uh, on uh, four indicators, gender-based violence, education, employment, and leadership. And you can see some of the treaties or the strategies uh, which were created, the treaties signed, um, the Istanbul, so-called Istanbul Convention, which was uh, signed uh, in 2017 by the EU, uh, and so on. You can see them now on the screen, with the most important being the gender equality strategy for 2020-2025. This was created by the European Commission, and it addresses uh, what was mentioned earlier, and thank you very much for mentioning this, the three R's. Um, equal and equitable rights, just representation, and balanced allocation of resources. Um, in this strategy, they um, talk about six pillars which uh, they need to follow. Um, and uh, again, you see uh, them now on the screen, they sort of go along the, uh, the SDG for gender equality and empowerment of uh, women and girls. Um, I will talk a little bit about gender mainstreaming and the intersectional perspective, uh, but it is also important to look at number six, uh, which deals with um, uh, the foreign policy. So the idea that they will uh, take this issue forward in their foreign policy and uh, address gender equality and women, women's empowerment. 
Um, just to look a little bit uh, in detail at this um, uh, strategy uh, for gender equality of the European Union, you have some data. Uh, unfortunately, the data regarding violence is 10 uh, years old, but this is the latest that, uh, that Eurostat 2022 provides. Uh, we have some data from the strategy with um, the idea that uh, uh, you have it here in blue, 33% of women in the EU have experienced physical and or sexual violence, 55% of women in the EU uh, have been sexually harassed. Uh, but of course, uh, we know that uh, when we talk about physical and sexual violence, this um, goes hand in hand with reporting. So if women don't report it, we don't have it in the statistics, in other words. Um, this is the data that we have from the reports that we have. Uh, next, uh, regarding the gender pay gap, again, you have uh, here statistics um, in progress from or, or regress, depending from uh, of all the countries from 2015 and 2020. Uh, so after uh, one year in the uh, in the pandemic, but generally uh, the statistics show that um, in uh, the European Union we have a 15.7 percent gender pay gap with an almost double gender pension gap. And in terms of employment, again uh, data by country. I'm going to share this uh, PowerPoint with you at the end, so you will have it. You will have all the data if you need it. Um, with um, extracts from the strategy uh, talking about um, uh, the, the gap in employment, especially for women born outside the EU, uh, as compared with women born in the EU, and also a category of women which is most uh, discriminated in the European Union, the Roma women. In terms of care work, uh, in the European Union, as everywhere else in the world, women spend more hours than men uh, doing uh, unpaid uh, household work. Um, and most of this uh, work is, again, uh, done by women with a migrant uh, background. Moreover, the mentality, the thoughts, the ideas in the European Union, of, of Europeans in general, is that uh, women should do this kind of work and that um, the main role of a man is to earn money for, for their family. And here you have, again, statistics for all the countries. Uh, regarding leadership now, um, re so representation, uh, it is important to say that in the current commission, the von der Leyen commission, um, we have uh, the largest uh, number of female wom women commissioners, um, with also the largest number or the greatest number of, uh, or percentage, 39% of elected members of um, women in the European uh, Parliament, and also um, in the local uh, parliaments, in the national parliaments, 32.2. Uh, but the situation uh, differs, uh, again, by country, as you could see. Um, also, uh, in um, in uh, the um, in in terms of positions held by women in senior uh, management, only 7.5 of board chairs are held by women, and only 7.7 percent of uh, CEOs in the uh, European Union's largest listed companies are women. So very very small numbers there talking about uh, increasing them, doing quotas, all sorts of things. Uh, it hasn't worked so far, maybe in the future. Also uh, talking about representation, uh, if we look at the most important uh, positions in the European Union, um, most of them are held by women. Um, so for example, here in this picture on the left-hand side, this lady here is the president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen from Germany. Right in the middle, the president of the Central European Bank, Christine Lagarde from France. And here on the right hand side, the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola from uh, Malta. And at the beginning of this week, uh, we now have uh, the first uh, women who has been, a uh, woman who has been elected um, president of the European Court for Human Rights. So, as I said, most of the representative positions or leadership positions in the European Union are held by women. 
So going back to uh, our idea of a feminist foreign policy, how feminist is indeed the, the foreign policy of the European Union and also of the different countries in the European Union. And here I would like um, first and foremost to make this distinction between feminist and gender uh, neutral in terms of foreign policy, but also um, in general. And um, uh, just to, to remind you that when we talk about foreign policy, um, uh, this is a field whose structures are particularly uh, strongly male dominated. Um, and therefore a, a field which privileges the uh, perspectives, ideas, and, and um, uh, experiences of men. So if we uh, uh, talk about it in terms of gender neutral, uh, that would only reinforce and reproduce uh, the same kind of gender inequalities uh, just because uh, they don't take into uh, consideration all the different uh, gender specific uh, perspectives and instead it cements the status quo. So therefore it is very important to, to talk about a feminist foreign policy, which is exactly what this program is doing. So we are in agreement here because uh, by talking about it being feminist, we underline the intention to go uh, beyond the surface and of attacking the uh, um, structures. So going for structural changes, going for uh, disruptive and transformative uh, policies than just the, just the surface. So um, as it was mentioned earlier, um, these are the countries uh, that sort of uh, assume a feminist foreign policy with the ones in purple uh, being uh, members of the European Union with of course Sweden being the first, Sweden again being the first to uh, say that they have a feminist foreign policy in 2014. And in uh, 2019, they came up with a handbook of their for feminist foreign policy in which they described the three R's, which were, as were mentioned earlier, the rights, representation and resources to which they added a fourth R, uh, the reality of women's and girls' lives. Um, um, acknowledging the fact that uh, we don't have just one reality, but uh, not even in the EU, let alone uh, globally so that we have um, this added context sensitivity. However, there are some uh, criticisms or critiques which are addressed to uh, this idea of um, uh, foreign policy of uh, Sweden or the EU or all of the countries that say they have it, not that they shouldn't have it. Of course, everybody's happy that they, uh, they say they have a feminist foreign policy, but that in fact, it is not uh, entirely feminist. And the first criticism addresses the idea of arms control and war, uh, which we can now see, especially now with um, a Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. We know that a feminist foreign policy would uh, mainly and uh, would mainly mean disarmament. Um, instead, uh, especially now, we can see um, this idea of. Um, uh, of war, which which is um, prevalent, and you know, being from a from a country which is very close to the Russian Federation, and in fact, we we do have borders with uh, Ukraine, land border, and also maritime border. We share uh, the Black Sea with them. I can say that I'm. I mean, I do understand the theory behind it and uh, what the feminist foreign policy should uh, should be and how it should. Um, uh, be more about peace and so on. But at the same time, it's kind of difficult to not to accept that in specific situations like the one in which we are now, uh, it could be problematic. Well, the second one um, deals with the imposition of Western norms, um, as you probably uh, can very easily imagine. Uh, just because these um, for, foreign policies, although they declare themselves feminist, um, are about um, or uh, are mostly about liberal feminism or uh, feminist universalism, and uh, fail to do justice to the diversity of the cultural uh, context in the world. So the um, the um, preoccupation is that a, um, a, foreign, a feminist foreign policy uh, that we have now in the European Union would focus more on women in decisions of power 
uh, rather than in structural changes. Um, so, you know, there has been a change from a political choice into uh, to more technical positions. So now uh, we need to go back a little bit and, and um, try to do the structural changes that I was talking about. And um, um, as I said at the beginning, I also wanted to touch a little bit uh, the idea of gender mainstreaming because it is so important and we all admit and we all um, say that, you know, um, having the goal to realize gender equality in public policies in all their aspects and also um, dealing with gender representation and so on is extremely important. Um, however, Oh, and, and here I also uh, included some ideas from uh, Sylvia uh, Wolby's book, The Future of Feminism, uh, which he published in 2011 regarding gender mainstreaming. Um, however, uh, there are some, some challenges and also some critiques regarding mainstreaming. And I just wanted to mention those because I think it is very, very important to, to look at the um, uh, possible problems that we might have and to be able to address those uh, those issues. Um, so I listed some of them. I think from all from all of those um, you are uh, you are aware of the fact that uh, you know it could be problematic just because uh, we have uh, gender mainstreaming in documents without actually um, internalizing the ideas of gender mainstreaming. And also uh, this idea of cooptation, uh, which deals with uh, the fact that um, the activists and uh, the um, NGOs uh, who are supposed to uh, trigger feminist changes are somehow um, uh, swap, uh, taken over by the uh, by this mainstreaming of gender, and uh, they are in between uh, the. Um, uh, their their state policies and the international um, uh, financing organisms and their own commitments to women and changes that they um, sometimes don't know exactly what to do. So this is there is a challenge there. Um, Angela McRobbie was also uh, talking about post-feminism or the dilution of feminism or feminism undone. Uh, which has to do with this new generation of, of uh, feminists throughout the world, of women who were born uh, within feminism, um, and who now, especially through popular culture, um, series, books, and so on, um, uh, don't really understand the, or, or don't understand so much the, the fight that feminist, the structural changes that feminism uh, should uh, trigger. Also, as we live in this neoliberal uh, patriarchal context, uh, we, we have the marketization of feminism or commercialization of feminism. Uh, we talk about business feminism or as Nancy Fraser put it in an article, uh, uh, feminism having become the handmaiden of capitalism and how to reclaim it, she says in this article. Um, mainstreaming also meant uh, getting used to, to to, to such words, to such labels, equality, feminism, gay normality, and so on. So we don't really internalize and don't really understand what, uh, what they mean. I mentioned Sylvia Wolby earlier, and uh, she sees three challenges in, in this book of uh, 2011, um, among which mainstreaming the neoliberal context and also co-optation. I also added you know, populism, nationalism, um, the pandemic, and how, what kind of future of feminism we can envision. Um, so what uh, I would like to propose in the last five minutes of my presentation is a grassroots bottom-up uh, perspective, uh, which comes from um, a manifesto published in 2019, uh, you probably know it, Manifesto for the 99%. If you don't know it anyway, I sent the document so you can read it. Um, uh, Cinzia, Ruza, Titi, Pataracai, and Nancy Fraser um, co-authored this manifesto, uh, which starts from the crisis of the society as a whole in which we are at the moment. Um, and they uh, try to envision, uh, because we are, the, as they say, at the fork in the road, they try to envision the path which we need uh, to take, which should be one where equality and freedom are the premises and not the aspirations, they say. They also come up with 11 theses, 
for the 99%. Um, and here you can see them, they deal with, um, you know, feminism being anti-capitalist, um, uh, being um, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, eco-socialist, also dealing with the idea of uh, trans uh, transnational uh, feminism. So they talk about feminist internationalism and so on. And um, uh, they address all the issues which we also saw in the um, uh, in the the other type of approach. So the e in the e UN and the EU uh, documents. And the illustration that I wanted to focus on uh, just a little bit, uh, just in one minute, comes from Poland, a country in the European Union, uh, which since 2016 have seen um, this kind of um, fight, uh, which uh, again, the authors um, of a document which I sent in advance, Agnieszka Graf and, and uh, Erspieta Korolczuk, uh, call populist feminism for ordinary women. So um, the right-wing government of Poland, conservative government of Poland started um, um, uh, this type of policies against the reproductive um, rights of women. Uh, um, they started in 2016, they managed to uh, pass the law uh, last year. And ever since then, um, Poland has witnessed a women's mobilization of uh, unprecedented scale with marches, rallies, uh, pickets, public debates, social media campaigns. Um, you uh, see here a picture from, from one of those um, uh, rallies. But what I wanted to say is that this is in agreement with a more global uh, kind of um, uh, movement uh, which uh, also which started had started a year earlier in 2015 uh, in Argentina. You probably know about it. Uh, it's called uh, let me check Ni una menos, um, and uh, it spread uh, throughout um, South America, Central America, and then Europe, uh, especially Spain and Italy. In Italy, it's called non, non una di meno. So um, in brief and in conclusion, this kind of new sustainable feminist discourse, which comes from the bottom up, the feminist for 99%, um, is anti-capitalist and, and talks about um, freedom for all rather than individual freedom, which as you know, is the idea of a, li a liberal type of feminism. Um, so in conclusion, um, we have those, and, and here you can also see a picture from the movement in Argentina. So what I wanted to emphasize in, in my presentation is that in uh, gender and sustainable development discourses, we can have, broadly speaking, we can have a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And I just wanted to emphasize both of them. So I just um, summarized a little bit what Professor Patel uh, has done in her presentation, the relevance of the SDGs for gender equality, focusing on SDG five. I, I also talked about um, the European Union level, the instruments that we have in the European Union, um, the, the situation at which we are now. And then um, I talked about uh, feminism for ordinary women, so the bottom-up approach, this other type of uh, sustainable development discourse that I think is extremely important. And um, here you have the work cited. So again, uh, you can um, have a look at them. Some of them are online sources, which you can easily access. Um, so um, again, I'm going to leave this with the, with the organizers. So thank you for this. Let me stop my uh, Thank you, Professor Roxana Manik Marcus, for a very, very detailed and uh, giving a global perspective and world economy as a unit of analysis you took. And I think I, your ending with the manifesto of 99% is a mind blowing. And I think it gives a lot of uh, food for thought for all of us. And I think the, uh, your emphasis on neoliberal patriarchal context and the commercialization and marketization, how it is impacting the uh, gender equality discourse, that's very important. As against that, what we need is a grassroots feminism bottom-up approach. And I think that, that this has really made uh, today's day uh, extremely valuable. And now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, uh, anyone can intervene or ask questions or 
expand the arguments. Please unmute yourself and speak because I don't see any question in the neither in the chat box not in nor in the Q and A box. So when no hand is raised so far. In fact, there has been a lot of discussion right from the year 2000. We have been discussing Millennium Development Goals and also the SDG goals have been discussed since 2015. Yeah, there are three uh, uh, participants have raised their hand. Professor Alia Khan, please uh, in, unmute yourself and speak. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Vibhuti and Professor Ruksana uh, for a very, very um, comprehensive presentation on um, the feminist movement and um, sustainability um, nexus. My question is about uh, what are your impressions about uh, Global South has really, um, you know, um, infused the ethos of the sustainable development goals in terms of their feminism. Because uh, the SDGs, uh, for example, uh, the very, very nascent type of um, feminist, uh, fourth wave feminism that is uh, in Pakistan uh, right now, there is really no discourse about uh, sustainability in terms of SDGs. The only um, discussion is uh, of sustainability in the context of climate change. And that is also very recent um, too. So uh, if you would like to throw some light, either of you, thank you. Yes, Professor Roxana, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm, I, sorry. I, um, I'm, not, I'm not very um, familiar with the situation. Pakistan, um, but uh, what I've been trying to say is that um, uh -huh. the global south and also uh, my part of the world, which is Central and Eastern Europe, should have their voices heard in um, in in this context and in the feminist discourses. Um, and my concern is about uh, listening to them and. Um, uh, that is to the global south, but also to my part of the world, because what uh, I don't want to to see yet again <laughs> or to hear yet again is just the unique voice of the global north. Okay. And I think um, uh, from the point of view of the uh, bottom up feminism or the, the movements that uh, I mentioned, uh, we can see quite a lot of uh, things happening in the global south, as I said, with the movements in Argentina and South America, also in uh, Central and Eastern Europe with the, with the problems that we're facing in this part of the world. Um, I think uh, they're, 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 um, the voices of the, the feminists in, um, in, in our regions, <laughs> in our respective regions, um, are louder and louder, and uh, I think that's a wonderful uh, thing. But once again, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really know much about uh, the situation in Pakistan, so I can't comment. I don't know, maybe uh, Professor Patel knows more about Pakistan. Yeah. No, no, but yeah, in, uh, but I know more about India because uh, uh, sustainable development, as uh, Dr. Alia told us, that major discourse is focused on <coughs> climate change because we are continuously experiencing the double whammy of last two years of COVID and climate change. So there have been enough cyclones and uh, deluge and uh, floods in the uh, in the Himalayas, uh, the all and also the um, a lot of devastation that has taken place because of this, uh, uh, and lot of destruction of crops and all which has taken place due to uh, unseasonal rains or unseasonal cyclone and all. So that has been a very very and, and you you are experiencing it day in and day out, and that's why the discourse is more on that. But officially, because the country, the, the India is signatory to SDG, uh, at least Niti Aayog, which is the apex making body for the strategic planning of the country, they have come out with their own SDG goals and indices and the documents are there. So in the official discourse, 
and also in the universities and colleges and wherever there are think tanks, SDG is being discussed. But currently, if you see even the participants in this course, uh, they are or so many of them are represent the grassroots organization. There are trade union activists, representatives of peasant organization, representatives of the grassroots women, industrial workers. So they are also there in this course because I know them by name. And that's why uh, I can see their names even in the uh, participants list. So the healthy curiosity about SDG is there and realization that there is no uh, solution if you remain in your national boundary. You need, these are the complex issues which need a global collaboration, whether it is a question of vaccine or whether it is a question of smart city or whether it is a question of gender-based violence or addressing the poverty and hunger because one Ukrainian war has created so much of scarcity of grains in uh, African countries and even India is facing the pinch of it. So I think that that, that realization is that, that there is a, you, you just can't isolate yourself. You can't create your heaven of human development if you are isolated. You have to have a global connectivity. So that realization has come. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, the second question, uh, the most question is from Mr. Abdul. Uh, yeah, many people are also there. So yeah. Can, uh, yeah. Achal Chitalipi ji. Yeah. But there were three people had raised hand, no? Yes, ma'am. I will coordinate. Okay, you coordinate, please. Okay, okay. Achal ji, please go on. Please also. Uh, am I audible? You're yes. audible. There are please three please questions also. Yeah. Yeah. Please okay. also Thank you. Yes, I will. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Agnana, firstly, uh, for such uh, brilliant insights and such uh, such good summarization of uh, such a complex uh, you know, concept. Um, OK, so a little bit about myself. I uh, have worked with grassroots organizations on uh, gender and have uh, very recently also joined uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative. And uh, my question actually also is a derivative of uh, how I am uh, kind of uh, figuring out um, the development sector. Um, so my question briefly put is just to understand this point that you had raised around uh, co-option of uh, you know, uh, resistance leaders. And uh, yeah, it's basically on that. I wanted to understand if you could elaborate a little bit more giving citing examples or uh, some, some real time um, you know, cases. Uh, I ask that also because of this dilemma that I am currently trying to figure out uh, uh, to sort of merge the gap between bottom up and top down interventions, uh, given that uh, both of them are important. Um, but yes, but I, I'm, I'm still struggling and I'm still uh, trying to look for an answer. And in my understanding from some ways, uh, co-option uh, or say, uh, like you also mentioned, representation and top management uh, it definitely is uh, you know, uh, uh, a step forward, but on the other hand, uh, it looks like it's 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 a uh, it's a derailment to the uh, real cause of the movement. Um, and so, yes, <laughs> that is my Thank question. You. Thank you, Machal ji. We will also Thank take you. more question from Abdullahi Ibrahim ji. If you can Thank unmute, you. Abdullahi ji, you have to unmute. Okay, no issues. Madhumita Despande ji. Would you like to chip in? You've asked a question, you can unmute and ask the question. Okay, okay. thank I... you. I have unmuted. I have unmuted the, the system. Please, are you clearly hearing me now? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, we can. Also, please introduce yourself. I'm actually delighted. Um, I'm, this is a, a fascinating uh, forum uh, for scholars and academics to express their perspective on the issue of uh, gender and equality uh, in global perspective. Uh, the, there are key questions I want to ask. And in the first day when we started this uh, webinar, I think I raised the same, uh, the same question and I've not been satisfied enough on the, on the answers to these uh, questions. The question is, uh, I think uh, with all what has been what have been presented so far, I think we have uh, these uh, areas. There are two key areas in issue of uh, gender equality and uh, justice in gender. I think we have to explore the the issue of uh, culture and religion. In case of Pakistan, we know the we know Pakistan. The majority of uh, 
of a citizen of Pakistan tends to be Muslims. So then the issue of a religion in that aspect can be explored. I know the equal, I mean, the issue of a gender in, connection related issues yeah yeah um, <clears throat> i can't hear him anymore yes. hello okay. Abdulali. yeah okay. Well, try to, uh, get him again so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, i'm back i'm back i'm sorry okay. yeah, yeah okay go ahead yes sir please go ahead kindly be brief Not working. Yeah. So we both in my would you like to take the question? First one was yeah. the question about of Madhubita Deshpande. By Madhubita Deshpande? Yes. About yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think patriarchy is a very, very five thousand year old uh, value system which controls sexuality, fertility, labor. It is like an octopus. You remove one tentacle and other seven tentacles again put you down. So uh, you are very much right. But uh, we have to fight against both because the uh, capitalism, it also with the market uh, supremacy and market fundamentalism, it also creates a division of the human beings. And it's not only women, but everybody, women, men, uh, children, all of them are subjugated. So I don't think that there is a I, in isolation, we can't fight against patriarchy. We, we can, we, even if you fight against patriarchy, but the material reality and the structure, economic structure, that also needs to be addressed. So I think we have to have a multi-pronged battle. And, and as uh, Dr. Professor Roxana told us, the bottom-up approach. And that's what the majority of the people who are toiling poor and who are at the receiving end of both patriarchal onslaught and the uh, market fundamentalism, I think we have to... Uh, come together and that's why the solidarity across intersectional marginality becomes very important very very important and i think that some of the east european countries have shown unfortunately the mainstream media doesn't project the heroic struggles that are happening at a ground level no so that is the major because media is also controlled by the world capitalism yeah okay. yes I, I very much agree that they go uh, hand in hand i think i focused maybe a little bit more on, on uh, anti-capitalism uh, rather than uh, anti-patriarchy, just because I assumed that we all agree <laughs> that we uh, yeah. the feminism is against uh, patriarchy uh, anyway. Going back to, to the idea of um, uh, co-optation, and um, I think, uh, I don't know if I can uh, still share that, that bit, but anyway, I can uh, read it to you. There was a bit on the um, on one of my slides about a definition of cooptation, which is absorbing uh, elements into the leadership or policy determining structure of an organization as a means of averting threats to its stability or existence. In other words, you um, get activists or NGOs uh, into the structures um, so as to avoid uh, their criticism of the said structures, if you know what I mean. So you, in other words, you just because, or, or you pay them, you don't necessarily uh, bring them into the structures, but you finance them to, um, so to speak, uh, uh, do their job, to, to do their projects, but in fact, you impose the type of projects that you want them to do. You can manipulate their work into doing the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of work that you are interested in. So there is this danger of the non-governmental organizations, the grassroots activists and so on, to falling prey to this kind of uh, discourse in which uh, they are, um, absorbed by power structures in, in this way and manipulated um, into uh, creating the kind of uh, policies that the power structures want them to create. And um, for example, um, 
and the other one was focusing on um, the other idea that I, I put forward was focusing on um, um, technical roles rather than a change of policies. So, for example, I showed how in the European Union we have uh, so many women in top positions, which doesn't necessarily mean that, the, of course, it's good to have women, it's good to have representation and so on, but the next step from a feminist perspective would be to challenge the power structures altogether, so to change, to, to see structural changes rather than just this uh, these surface changes, okay, now we have uh, women in this position, so that's okay, that's fine now. And for example, I just wanted to uh, to mention a book, um, you probably know about this, I can't remember the year, but it's a recent book by Sheryl Sandberg, who's a, the former CEO of Facebook. Um, and the title is uh, Lean In, and she te teaches us to lean in, that is to take her individual example and um, uh, get to the level of you know CEO in the business world. But of course, we know that uh, this isn't possible for all of us. Of course, she reached that level because she comes from a, a background of privilege. And the women that I showed uh, who are in these positions in the European uh, Union also come from a background of privilege. Uh, so uh, not acknowledging the fact that they, they, they were privileged to uh, be able to fulfill these roles is um, a bit of a bit problematic. So we need to understand this. Like for example, Ursula uh, von der Leyen, so the High Commissioner, uh, the European um, leader uh, of the European Commission. She is a doctor. Uh, she is uh, the mother of seven. <laughs> Roberta Mezzola has five children. Of course, we are aware that had they been <laughs> from another social class or from another background or social group, they wouldn't have been able to rely on the un unpaid work of their family and also the uh, paid work of uh, migrant, possibly migrant women or other women anyway, uh, to raise their children, to... Um, you know, to allow her to have this kind of career and also political career to be in these top positions. Uh, so the kind of neoliberal discourse which tells us that you can, as a woman, you can do whatever you want to do. You you have it. You got it, as they say in the U.S. Uh, they got it. I mean, only a certain group of privileged women can do it. And we need to understand that, uh, you know, it's complicated for uh, for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, so, for example, when I mentioned the army as well, if we have uh, women in the army, now we do. We in, I'm not sure about India or your countries, mm -hmm. but in in the EU, we do. We have women we representatives and so on. You too, right? But um, uh, these women um, have a certain role, and of course, it's good to have them there. But again, we need to go beyond and change the structure of the military policies okay. towards a more peaceful and uh, uh, world and the world of solidarity uh, th th that was the idea with uh, with cooptation and um, i hope i uh, i explained it better this time yeah, yeah yeah okay so we move to the next set of questions prakash ji is here prakash ji if you can unmute Prakash ji here, I'll meet you. Okay, oh, please also introduce us. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, generally, when we talk about uh, uh, sustainable development and all, uh, we generally tend to focus on the urban side. Uh, rural women uh, directly uh, suffer the heat of climate change and all, and we have environmental refugees. And women are, many, many women are a part of that. Um, how uh, we can, you know, empower these women to at least get their voice? Uh, can we uh, do this through increasing political representation or through education? How we can give voice to these women? Yeah. 
I think first important thing is uh, uh, women in the local self-government bodies. I think even in Africa, it is the rural women and it is the forest women who have raised the question about uh, uh, climate discourse. And they are the ones who are at the forefront of climate discourse. Same in Latin America. And here, like uh, continuous uh, dialogue with, uh, they are working at that local level. Only thing, their voice is not amplified. So the role of this uh, uh, no, uh, national, regional and international bodies to amplify their voices, more documentation, giving mic in their hand so that uh, they can bring out what is happening at the uh, 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 at the ground level. In the very first document which the UNFP had prepared, there was no word called woman. No, it was a completely gender blind uh, document, or maybe 150, 200 pages, but it was only talking about global warming and how the countries are devastated and all. But how the people in the countries and how they were differentially impacted, there was no voice about that. It was the pressure, bottom of pressure of the women's organizations in the, and especially in the rural and uh, tribal age of women, indigenous women, which are, they are known as in the international discourse, that it uh, the, the question of uh, climate change and sustainable development came center stage, whether it was a Rio conference or whether it was ICPD, International uh, Convention on Population and Development, where they were talking about population versus development. And they, these women, they said, no, it is population and development. It is not a question of population bomb, which is posing problem to, my, to the on this planet, but it was the kind of growth and the consumerist culture and the capitalist development, and the, which is enhancing an ex uh, inequality exponentially that is a problem and the nature of lifestyle that we have uh, which is so much of waste generation that we do and over exploitation of the natural resources which we are not replenishing so i think that came from rural women only the first concern for the environmental issue came from 1972 chipko women they, these were the women in the uh, mountainous areas uh, totally uh, disconnected from the urban areas and they are the ones who invited our attention to arbitrary deforestation and the question of uh, uh, global warming and how the uh, floods were created in unseasonal rains and drying up of uh, streams and rivulets and uh, tributaries uh, that was uh, that consciousness came basically from the rural women. They were, they were women in Chamoli and Tehri Karwal. And later on, we saw even in Amazon, the Save Amazon campaign, that was basically by the fisher folks, forest drivers and the rural women. The only thing is that they, their, their voices are not there in the mainstream. And that is the role of people like you and me and the participants here, that how we amplify their voices. No? So more documentation, more researches, more data, and also the, the taking these concerns, as uh, Professor Roxana told us, that it is the 99% women's feminism is what we want, gender equality for 99%. That's very important. Okay. You can so, supplement, Dr. Rox Professor Roxana. Ma'am, you want to go? Yeah, yeah no, you, uh, you were very clear and uh, yeah, I fully agree. I just wanted to say that it's a slow process. Yeah, it is. Um, so... Uh, it won't happen overnight, it won't happen tomorrow, but uh, that's the way to do it. You know, listening to these women, uh, who can listen to these women? We can listen to these women, the NGOs and uh, the activists and so on, and then try to bring their voices to the higher uh, forums. There is no other way, because otherwise people will not listen to them and will not listen to, to these uh, so-called marginal groups. Um, their voices will not be heard, but we 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 can work as intermediaries to make their voices heard. That's why it's so important to oppose cooptation, okay. you know, to 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 uh, go forward on our path and to follow the road that we have uh, decided upon and uh, continue. Dr. Jyoti Tripathi. Okay, Dr. Jyoti Tripathi ji, please. Pranaya Manjari ji. Uh, hello, uh, yes. my name is Pranaya Manjari. Um, uh, so I'm an ordinary citizen. I think being a woman is sufficient for me right now at this time, this point of time to outrage. So uh, like there are 86 rapes happened in 2021 in India. Uh, I want to know, ma'am, 
uh, do you think that the time has come that women has to claim politics in India? Uh, I mean, I don't feel safe. I'm 43 now. I still don't dare to go at nine o'clock in the night in my uh, gully of my city. So how to claim? Because gender politics is completely missing in India. Uh, um, crime against women is not a not priority a pri for any not a priority for any political party. Right, and from where you are joining, ma'am? With city? Uh, Bhubne, so Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so I think, Priyan uh, Manjari, whatever you are suggesting that getting into the politics, but that too, unless you are backed by the collective, women's collective, you are not protected. If you are just uh, contesting election, you will be, there'll be mercenaries and the money power, mafia power, muscle power, which will be used against you. So wherever women have been successful as politicians or in public life, they have been backed by their constituency. So that is also equally important. And that's why when you see the gender-based violence increasing, yes, it is increasing everywhere. One, because now the reporting is happening. Earlier, women were shooed out. After 2013, there is a clear-cut mandate that any complaint about gender-based violence has to be uh, registered in the police station. If the police officers say no, they will be punished, they will be suspended, they will lose their job. So that is one. Reporting has become more this thing. Plus, several helplines are created. So they, they are able to reach to the uh, official bodies, no, which are uh, criminal justice system, number two. Number three is that, that now the target our targets are more adolescent girls because women like you and me, we have become conscious of our right. Even we go out, we go in a group, you know, but it is the uh, innocent young girls who come from protected environment. They are the ones who have been targeted and mostly they are from the marginalized community. But the answer is collective endeavor. We had a robust women's movement during 1980s and 90s. My generation is aged. I'm 67. So you can imagine I was, at that time, I was the youngest in the feminist movement. I was 15 years old. So that is also there. So main thing is to create collectivity. That's what the solidarity of women's collective response is the only answer to prevent witch hunting. Because even if you see in Bhubaneswar, there is a national alliance of women or there are the, wherever there are organized attempts, they are able to combat this violence. They are reduced, they're able to reduce this rape culture because rape culture comes from the kind of pornography and media and the kind of values that these children are doing. Even if you see who are the criminals, who are the ones who are indulging into sexual crime, they are in the age group of 14 to 19. They are the young adults who have first time they are seeing bodily changes and they are the, the only investment with the society has made in them is that of a pornography, which is based on sadomasochism. Women are masochist, men are sadist. So they, the sexual violence is glorified, valorized by pornography. And this is what is the culture, which is escalating violence against women. And we need to fight against this culture. And as Professor Roxana said, the change is going to, be, unless we make this effort on a day-to-day -day basis and challenge this rape culture, we are not going to have bright and safe future for our daughters. So, so that that is a mandate for you and me. You are in your 40s, I am in my late 60s, and we still have to continue fighting against it by training and capacity building and uh, mobilizing women, making them aware of their rights and also having dialogue with the boys. It's very, very important why these young boys are behaving in such a manner. What kind of values are given to them by their families, by the communities, by the media, that they have become such rogue uh, uh, and, and such a perverse in their behavior vis-a-vis -vis opposite sex. No, So that is the it's it's also a very important challenge that we are facing and this is globally the escalation of gender based violence is not only in india uh, the reports of all the rapid assessment surveys and the un advisory over the last two years have shown that during the lockdown in all countries gender based violence has escalated exponentially yes but um an important aspect of gender based violence is when and in this rape culture is when um it happens within the family especially the you know the extended family and so on so i don't really know uh, about the situation in india i assume it's the same as everywhere else i mean there's quite a high number of uh, of rapes happening within the family and uh, sometimes within the marriage itself 
So it's very difficult uh, if we come from this kind of um, a pa patriarchal context in which uh, mm, it's difficult to fight your um, rapist, especially when uh, the rapist is your own husband or somebody in your family, an uncle or um, I don't know, a cousin or somebody in the family. And um, because it brings along shame and uh, complications and so on. So it's it's very, very difficult. And this is happening in, in my country, especially in rural areas as well, um, and uh, in other countries in Europe and everywhere else in the world. So I think by by talking among ourselves about those things, we just show that uh, you know it's a global phenomenon, as uh, Professor Patel was saying. It's not just uh, an Indian-based phenomenon, it's happening everywhere. And uh, we need to, to try to find um, a ways to fight it, um, um, yeah, and I think, uh, um, I, I can't remember who uh, from the, um, who asked this question, but uh, she raised an important issue, which is about uh, political parties and uh, how they have to actually address the issue. And I think we're somewhat lucky in the, in the EU that they um, uh, somehow, when they see that nothing is happening, they come with what they call directives, or you know, they come with uh, these ideas to enforce change, um, and then they check and they want to see that the, that change has been uh, done. So in a way, we are lucky that uh, these kinds of policies um, are more enforced than I assume in in a country like India, where you have a political party which has been there for many years now and it's kind of complicated to say to them okay so you need to address the issue who's going to say that to to them yeah uh, so i think when we talk of world peace we have to also talk about peace in the house that means incestuous rape because if you if you see deconstruct the uh, national crime records bureau data the incestuous sexual violence is also extremely high among the teenage girls and so many of them have to come for abortion and they don't know it's a late stage abortion they have to come to the government uh, uh, to, to the civil hospitals because the private sector won't do it because of the medical legal aspect but that is also there and here at least we have mtp act medical termination of pregnancy act uh, which yeah. allows that if it is a case of a rape or a sexual violence, then the woman and girl has a right. Yeah. If I may add something, because we talked so much about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, we have so many refugees uh, now in uh, my country, also in Poland, you can see how the situation is different because in Poland, they have very restrictive uh, reproductive uh, uh, rights and a very restrictive law. So they're not allowed to have abortions, um, just in very, very um limited situations um and a lot of women refugees come from ukraine who had been raped by the army by the russian army and um they want to have abortions basically because of course they it's a political thing that they uh, have been submitted to and they can't have it in in poland so that brings about a lot of discussion in this part of the world about uh about rape and um, uh, rape as a weapon of war and, uh, you know, genetic cleansing. changes, yes. Yes. Uh, genetic cleansing. cleansing, yes. And also what happened in the uh, Balkans region earlier with, uh, with the wars um, in the 1990s and so on. Okay, I'll stop because I think we're, we have- Yeah, we have Dr. Shobha Shinde. Can you please go ahead? Please unmute yourself and speak. So Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, we can hear. Thank you so much. It has been a stimulating discussion and I've really enjoyed myself. Uh, and you have set us thinking all the way along. Uh, a point which was raised that sustainable development is really re related nowadays only to climate change. But I feel that women have a major role to play in purchases and consumption patterns, recycling, access, as well as reducing waste. As you are an economist, Professor Patel, can you add to this or clarify this? 
Better? Yeah, you, you saw that my slide also on the responsible consumption, where it is very, very important that sustainable discourse, what is happening that was they were saying that it, the discourse is mostly uh, around climate change because the floods are happening, earthquake is happening, cyclones are happening. But the all 17 goals in that one particular goal is totally dedicated to the sustainable living, sustainable lifestyle. So I think that was the ribbon on my PPT. So I fully endorse what you said that we need to have a very responsible consumption. And also the industries, they have to be, whether it is a question of occupational health or uh, uh, releasing pollutants in the water bodies or in the land or in air, and also the packaging industry, the kind of waste that it generates in terms of overuse of plastic and what are the alternatives and uh, renewable uh, sources that we have. Uh, that also, I, I fully agree with what you have submitted, yes. There are two more questions. One, yes. Majyoti Tripathi has already asked. Rajiv Kumar. Rajiv ji and Archie Gupta ji is also here. Acha, Acha, please. And Tanuja Sasdev ji. Uh, women's democratic as well as human rights are being crushed in today's modern world. How can we see this question as a neoliberal question? It is very much a neoliberal question because neoliberalism is only creating advantages only for the microscopic minority and handful of them who are over exploiting and it's a predatory in nature and it is over exploiting the planetary resources it is over exploiting the human beings it is using all forms of dehumanized methods of managing super profit so always this kind of a, a centralization and concentration of power status and economic resources is has to resort to violence and it is the structures and systems it creates which also gets violent how come suddenly one particular forest forest dwellers become illegal occupants how do people who have been there for three four generations they 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 are completely bulldozed and thrown out of it and if they resist they are called extremists no so it is very much even the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar is the vested interest is that of transnational companies and multinational companies who want to come up with a giant plan for cheap labor. And that's why all those places where they are completely thrown out of those uh, areas, where, at those lands are at a throwaway price uh, or maybe at a zero uh, investment price, they have got it to establish industries. No overuse of mining the way of the chips for our micro for our smartphones how are, how are they getting it they are they are asking the thinnest african child who is malnourished who is hungry and he is the one who is sent inside the mine where the so that if you use these children the hole that you have to create in the mine is smaller than if an adult person goes everywhere in the every labor process is so full of violence so this is what the new neoliberalism creates, no? Might is right. If you have a gun in your hand, you can overpower anybody. That is the culture which neoliberalism creates. And impunity, with impunity, because nobody is going to catch them for violation of human rights. Right. Ma'am, there are no further questions. We are also over time. Uh, yeah. So we okay. have a way forward round from yeah. Dr. Okay. ma'am and yourself and to conclude. Yeah. Yes. So I would like to say that to counter the gender stereotypes created by patriarchal systems and structures, it must be given top priority by the state and non-state actors, along with fighting at, uh, at the uh, intersectional vulnerabilities and operations that are uh, happening in the neoliberal state. Developing leadership of women and sexual minorities in the development programs demands mainstreaming of gender sensitization programs and feminist foreign policy need to include in their action agenda, understanding the impact of business activities on natural resources, water and energy use, supporting new business models that can deliver clean and renewable energy, establish sustainable procurement policies, uh, supplies, uh, that uh, also supply for the code of conduct for the industry, promoting responsible consumption among the citizens through mark uh, and also the public relations activities, communication strategies have to be strengthened in this direction and sponsoring NGOs initiatives to restore degraded habitat and transformative policies for gender equality, gender responsive budgeting and gender equality today for sustainable future tomorrow. That should be our motto. 
and we need to uh, have a transnational solidarity once again. And uh, I would like to also make an announcement that those who have attended all four sessions and who fill up the feedback form will be given participation certification uh, after the 30th of September. Yes, Dr. Professor Oksana. Um, yes, as a conclusion, um, I just wanted to restate uh, that it is always relevant to pose questions and to analyze uh, existing and traditional power structures um, to permanently challenge discourses, especially the ones that seem clear and established and uh, even the ones that look progressive, um, and to critically discuss uh, governments and institutions, NGOs, individuals' positions vis-a-vis um, -vis with vis -vis power and, and such discourses. And I think uh, the great advantage of a feminist foreign policy resides, um, of course, in trying to solve uh, the inequalities and inequities and in the unbalances, but also in the very possibility of posing uh, these questions. Um, and raising the challenges and, and promoting uh, alternative discourses by also, as we said earlier, including the marginalized authority, the different voices in the mainstream. Um, this, this is my, these are my concluding remarks. Thank you. So now, Tripta, for a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, as we come to an end of session three on gender and sustainable development courses of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order, organized by FES India office and IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, GISC. I, Tripta Bhera, researcher, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks. We are grateful to our experts for the day three of this monsoon school, Professor Roxana and Professor Vibhuti Patel. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation and introduction. We thank our conveners, Ms. Jyoti Rawal and Dr. Simi Mehta and Dr. Arjun Kumar. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. We look forward to welcoming you on September 30th at 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time for our fourth day and the final day of this online monsoon school on the topic Gender, International Relations and Diplomacy by Professor Meenal Shivasta. Ambassador Anil Trigunayat and Professor Nirlima Shivastav. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in in the future to IMPRI Web Policy Talk and Web Policy Learning. Wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you.